uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. I, I very much appreciate uh, you taking the time out and, and I'm convinced that what we have to share for you today will be beneficial. So our plan here is to pit Hyper-V 2012 and vSphere 5.1 head to head and take a look at the real differences between them. The um, uh, we're doing this for many different reasons. One is to help you guys better understand uh, the, the various products. We will not be able to go into real deep depth on this like we would want to. Uh, you know, uh, we could spend five days and still not get through all of the details down to the nitty gritty on this. So uh, this should help us get uh, a long ways to where we where we need where we need things. The other side of this, uh, the, the next component here is uh, keep in mind that everything that we're going to be uh, discussing today comes, comes from both the consulting side of the house and uh, from our courseware development. We have two courses where a lot of this information will be derived from. One is the vSphere 5.1 Ultimate Boot Camp. Uh, of course, that vSphere Ultimate Boot Camp has been around before vSphere uh, was a term, <laughs> uh, when it was just ESX and, and uh, the, the Virtual Center. Uh, and uh, we also have, or will be releasing, a Microsoft Virtualization Ultimate Boot Camp. And those two courses uh, will give you a tremendous amount of in-depth knowledge. And, and they're all going to be role-based. They're intended to give you as an administrator the information that you actually need. Now, I'm uh, hearing individuals, they're telling me that there's still some feedback. Uh, I don't know if maybe um, both Mitch and, and Sean, while I'm sharing, if you guys want to mute yours. Uh, on your end, okay, there it cleared up, and then and then when you guys talk, you guys can uh, uh, can can chime in there. All right, thank you for that. I appreciate it. So today we've got a couple of key presenters. Uh, we have Mitch Garvis, uh, who is well, let's just say he's very gifted when it comes to the Microsoft. He's he's a gifted IT guy in general, uh, and that doesn't uh, discount his skills in 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 uh, Taekwondo. Uh, but his, uh, his real heart, of course, is tailored around the Microsoft products. Of course, he thinks that the vSphere project is a very good product, but he's here today to help us understand how the Microsoft Hyper-V can fit into that. Uh, Sean, of course, has an extensive background as well, and as you can see, he also has a lot of Microsoft skills, and, and he actually uh, began his uh, career uh, with Microsoft, and when virtualization came about, uh, he saw what, what VMware was doing and, and really liked it and, and, and became an expert, and both of these guys are exceptional, and, and as you'll see, there's not much they don't know. So this should really be uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, and you'll see that when they're discussing things, will go back and forth with regards to the different views and how you look at the various implementations of the products. We're going to handle this in a debate format. Uh, each one will, when we cover our topics, each one will have their turn in starting. And they'll have three minutes to present their topic and then when they do their rebut, uh, they'll have a two-minute rebuttal. Uh, so we're going to give each individual about five minutes on each of the five topics that we have chosen for today. Now, those uh, five topics are going to start with the pricing and installation. We'll take a look at management of the VMs and the operating systems, look at networking storage, and then the end result, how your environment performs. And that's going to be the key items that we're going to take a look at here. Now, um, uh, Mitch, I'm going to have you get started here. I do have a, a timer on my end, and I'll, I'll key in with just a few minor items here. 
but I'll give you three minutes uh, to get started here looking at the pricing and installation component of this particular section. So here we go guys, let's start taking a look at, uh, at the differences, how Microsoft looks at things, how VMware looks at things, and, and hopefully we'll get some real world discussions here uh, as we do some of these rebuttals. So Mitch, are you ready? I'm ready to go. All right, go right ahead. So there's no question when we talk about virtualization that Microsoft is going to take the lead on this one. Right out of the gate, everyone knows that Microsoft virtualization is going to cost a lot less. But when they say how much less, maybe we've already invested in our VMware infrastructure, maybe we already have uh, all of the training and all of the infrastructure. And it's, are the cost savings really going to make a difference when it comes to my environment? When you take into account retraining and re-architecting and rebuilding, well, here I have two uh, two graphs that compare Microsoft virtualization to VMware virtualization. The first one is based on 500 virtual machines with a uh, with a average CPU per core of six, where we see that Microsoft is going to cost $265,000 compared to about a million dollars for VMware. But on the other one on the side, we have 5,000 virtual machines, and that's where you see real cost differences, $2 million versus $14 million. We can see, the, we can see this cost comparison using a tool called uh, the cloudeconomics.cloudapp.net, the private cloud economics tool. Now, nobody's saying that virtualization is free. Not on Microsoft, not on ESXi. ESXi, of course, is a free hypervisor, but if you want to do anything with it, you've really got to invest in the vCenter and the, v, the uh, v Cloud Director. And with Microsoft, you have to invest in your system center 2012. But once you've got that in place, and you're going to have system center in place anyways, because it's managing your applications, it's managing your data recovery, it's managing your automation, it's managing your help desk. It's managing your uh, computer's life, uh, life cycle with Config Manager. Once you've already got that in place, the virtualization on the Microsoft side is just going to be so much easier and so much less expensive than it would be with any other platform, VMware being at the other side of that equation. Well, excellent, Mitch. Thank you. Uh, you 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 handled that in in far less time than three minutes, which means now you'll have an extra minute during your rebuttal. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, um, uh, Sean, uh, it, it's now your turn to come in and share a little bit about uh, uh, a, a rebuttal uh, on this. Uh, I'll give you uh, I'll give you two minutes, but remember, you'll also have three minutes to do the presentation. Uh, on, on the next set of items. So we're going to go back and forth with these gentlemen folks and by the way if you have questions feel free to type them into chat. I will be monitoring that. Um, we're going to do all of the questions at the end of the of the actual presentation here today. Alright, uh, Sean are you uh, online and ready to go? I am. All can right. you hear me? I can. Go right ahead. Okay, so looking at this slide here, it definitely looks like it's more compelling to go with VMware versus Microsoft. I look at these numbers and go, uh, was it 260000 for Microsoft versus a million for VMware? You know, what I look at, though, is what is the blue, the pink, the yellow, and the, and the red? So I, I went to the website that Mitch mentions on the slide, and uh, when we look at the colors there, the, the blue is for the cost of the operating system licensing, which is exactly the same for both Microsoft and VMware because they, they're both using Windows 2012 data center. When you look at the pink, it's for vCloud Suite. Hmm, okay, I don't have any customers running vCloud. They're all running vSphere with vCenter and ESXi. The yellow is $95,000 for vFabric APM. I don't have a single customer running vFabric. And the red, has anybody even heard of the VMware Service Manager? Nobody's running these things. So they're pitting this against things that people aren't even using. Um, so when I look at the true cost of doing this, the true cost of virtualization to run, uh, in this case, I believe you said 500 VMs, you can get by with that very easily on three or four ESX hosts for well under $50,000. But it, 
you know, looking at these slides, it does look much cheaper. Thank you, uh, Sean. We have um, about uh, 30 seconds left on, on this, but uh, if you're ready, we can go ahead and, and go into <clears throat> your presentation. Sure. Let's, uh, let's do that. Okay, so what I did was I had an actual company that uh, came to me about doing a VMware versus Microsoft solution, and they this company had about 60 VMs total that they were looking to build. They had uh, 40 that were Microsoft and 20 that were running Linux. They had, they had a combination of Linux OSs running CentOS, Ubuntu. They had some Oracle servers. They had some uh, specialized applications. This is for a trust fund that I'm working with here. Um, I'm actually at their facility in Los Angeles right now up in the conference room to do this. Um, so when we were looking at pricing this out, uh, we looked at because Hyper-V doesn't do memory sharing between Linux boxes the same way that VMware does, we were going to need a little bit more hardware for the Hyper-V side than we were with the uh, Microsoft side. So I got them some cheap servers. Um, this is on the low end here. We were looking at dual hexacore boxes with 64 gigs of RAM, about 6000 bucks a box. Um, so with vSphere, we figured we could use about three servers. Hyper-V, it would take about five. So you see the numbers there, just three times 6,000, five times 6,000. And then we have maintenance on the servers. So it came to about 12,000 for the maintenance, 800 bucks a year times three servers. Um, and then for five years of maintenance, we did the same thing with Hyper-V. Um, the hypervisor is totally free with Hyper-V. It's included, so awesome, free. Um, with vSphere, we got away with Essentials Plus, which is about 4,500 bucks. And then we got... Uh, about $1,500 for support. Um, for the OSs, using data center, server 2012, you pay per socket. So we, since we got away with three servers with vSphere, that would take six sockets. And with Hyper-V, it would take about 10 sockets. Um, they then have to pay for system center, which they're running a deal now for all the system center products. And uh, one of the things Mitch mentioned is they probably have it in place um, most of my customers don't, so they would have had to purchase it in this case of this customer. So here you're looking at they they had to pay 3600 times 5 or $18,000. So in the case of this small customer right here with just 60 VMs, you're, you're talking about VMware is almost half price of Hyper-V. You have about a minute left. Okay, so let's go to the next slide real quick. And then in this year, pretty much the same thing except we, we basically uh, went to 150 VMs, just tripled it here. And, and you'll see the numbers here. We went with four hosts for vSphere or seven hosts for Hyper-V. You, you can see all the numbers here. Um, and it came again cheaper, 94,000 for vSphere versus 135 for Hyper-V. Um, another point I'd like to mention, you'll see here that the OS is that this customer was running uh, was CentOS and Ubuntu. Ubuntu and Oracle are not even supported on Hyper-V. And I don't think that this company, which is a trust fund, is going to run their uh, their financial accounting and their uh, other packages on Oracle on an unsupported system, which would be Hyper-V. So that was one of uh, my customers. seconds. <laughs> all right, so that's all I got. All right, cool. Uh, Mitch, it, it, it's it's your turn, and and like I said, you only took a couple of minutes, so you get a you get a three minute rebuttal. And I am looking at this, and I see this big softball coming at the plate underhand, and let me take a swing at this. <coughs> if we want to move back to the previous slide, to the second previous slide, the first slide that we had here, uh, we see that he's got ten sockets worth of data center. Now. He's actually miscalculated this on two fronts. First of all, systems, uh, Microsoft's virtualization has, may not have the same memory compression, but on dual hexacore servers with maybe 128 gigabytes of RAM, you can run a lot more servers than you're talking about. I don't think he needs five, I think he needs three. But at the same time, the single license for data center server is actually covers two licenses. So even at the, or sorry, two sockets. So even if we're talking about five, uh, five servers, we're talking twelve thousand dollars, not twenty-four thousand dollars. So that's twelve thousand right there. But I think that the five servers are certainly overkill. I just architected an environment. 
for 1,200 virtual machines based on seven servers. That's 1,200, not 150. Now, if we want to go forward, oh, wow, I love this one. Ubuntu and Oracle are not even supported. Now, VMware will tell you up and down that, that Oracle is supported. Well, Oracle will tell you that it's not. Oracle, until recently, was only supported on one virtualization platform, and that was, of course, Big Iron, because Oracle, uh, Oracle only wanted to virtualize on their own. However, two weeks ago, Oracle came to a deal with Microsoft, and we announced that Oracle is now supported on only one uh, hypervisor other than Oracle, and that's Hyper-V, because we're going to be offering it in Azure. As for Ubuntu, absolutely supported. In fact, every kernel, uh, every Linux kernel after 2.42 has the bits for Hyper-V compatibility built in and just have to be enabled in the operating system. Well, excellent, Mitch. I, I appreciate that. You you kept that uh, at, at a nice, concise rate. Now, as you guys know, we could take this uh, and go back and forth between these two individuals for quite some time. And um, uh, uh, the the um, uh, I, I'm going to ask one question since we have just a little bit of time. Uh, uh, one one individual here asked. He he felt that this was skewed for VMware and and uh, um, Sean. I'm going to let you you know respond to to that question from uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, you mean the presentation or no? This particular financial uh, layout. You mean saying that? Well, Mitch said it could run on three servers, and I said it could run on five. Uh, it, it really depends on the size of your VMs. I, I can tell you that the Oracle VMs that they're currently running are 64 gigs in size um, for their databases. So they have right around 8 terabytes of uh, databases for Oracle. So is it skewed for VMware? I don't know. 64 gig VM. All right. All right. Excellent. Um now, this is something else, uh, Mitch. I'm going to let you respond to this. Uh, in the slide here, uh, we have the, the pricing uh, at 5 for uh, SCCM, for System Center. And when, when, um, uh, when you were looking at, uh, at, at Microsoft, they said the pricing is, is for two, the, the one price is for two processors. Uh, so, so how does that work uh, in this? Is this pricing all goofed up on the System Center as well? Well, I'll, I have to tell you honestly, as a technical evangelist, I haven't had to worry about pricing a whole lot. However, we do have what are called DCI licenses, which include both the operating system and the, um, and the system center. But I'm going to tell you, you're looking at a mix of Linux and Ubuntu and Oracle and CentOS. If you're doing only that, you can get away with only using System Center and not even spending a dime on the hypervisor because you can use Hyper-V Server, which is free. People laugh at me all the time when I say you can build a full failover environment with Hyper-V Server for no cost uh, and, um, and put thousands of Linux virtual machines on it. There's no cost to you on that. Excellent. So I can't tell you what the costs are specifically, but I will tell you, yeah, it does look pretty skewed. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, now... Well, uh, I'll, I'll address that in that you could also build with ESXi free servers and not use Virtual Center. No fail which, over. Uh, you can actually program it into it. And I, I joke about this because I thought it was dumb, but there's a guy on my daughter's soccer team who's running 48 free ESXi hosts in a data center doing hosting for customers. <laughs> and he has, Does, and he has coded, coded uh, are you saying that he, he coded in the, the failover? Yeah, he did it himself. I'm not saying it's supported or anything, but he did it for free. <laughs> Very interesting. Can we agree that it's not wise? <laughs> oh, I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, guys. Let me address one more thing, Dwayne. Uh, for the for the person who asked if it was skewed towards micro uh, towards VMware, I want I want to be clear that Shane and I are both big boys and we can we can handle each other. We both love both platforms. I don't think there's anything skewed. I think that whether you virtualize on VMware or on Microsoft, you're going to do well. It's going to be come down to cost. So don't worry. 
uh, about one or the other, you're going to have to find out what the costs are for you. And by the way, the costs are never going to be the manufacturer suggested retail price. You're going to call your rep and they're going to say, oh, you want this? Let me make you a deal, whether it's Microsoft <laughs> or VMware. Uh, very good, very good, very true, very, very true. Okay, um, uh, Tom was asking a question of where we're going to be comparing pricing versus product benefits. Uh, uh, Tom, we're getting into the product benefits. That's the next uh, the next four four sections here is all about uh, various product benefits. And Sean, it's your turn to kick off here with the management of VMs and, o and OSs. So uh, feel free to to tell us what you want us to know about this this section. Well, when, when you build a vSphere environment, uh, typically even in small environments, you'll have a, what's called an ESX host, and it will be managed by a product called vCenter. Within vCenter, you'll do all of your management of the host and the virtual machines. You can do things like uh, deploy multiple virtual machines through templates. You'll be able to go in and manage the OS from there. You'll be able to patch the OSs, patch the hosts, be able to monitor performance from there, and you really don't have to buy anything extra. The one thing that's nice about VMware is it is a I mean, more mature platform for virtualization. Hyper-V hasn't been out as long as VMware, and that you know they they really came out in 2008. So VMware has been around a lot longer. Um, there's a lot more stuff available for VMware as far as free tools, as far as integration. I will say that Microsoft is really catching up, um, and there's a lot of stuff. For example, uh, when you, when you look at networking. Uh, the Cisco virtual switch has been out for quite a while. It's now also out for Microsoft, but you know it's been out for a long time. So it, it has more mature tools, and there's a, there's a lot of tools available. Like this one tool here, RV Tools. It's a free tool. If you're running the VMware environment, you better check it out. It's really cool. It, it's a uh, it's helped me discover a lot of problems like free space that clients are having an issue with, snapshots that uh, they didn't know existed. Um, just potential problems that they might have. And it's a great little tiny free tool that you can implement. Um, and there's a ton of tools out there which are really cool. So that's the basics there. Excellent. Thank you. You gave yourself an extra minute in, in, in the rebut, so that's very good. Um, uh, Mitch, uh, a rebuttal on this, or do you want to do a rebuttal and move right into uh, your slide on this as well? I have nothing. To, the only thing I have to rebut is that Hyper-V hasn't been around long enough. I agree. It hasn't been around as long as VMware has, but we're pretty much in our fourth iteration, we're five or six years. I think we can call ourselves an adult platform by now. As far as more stuff being available, uh, this is Windows. Windows has been around since, well, I think we celebrated 26 years. There's a whole lot of tools available, and most of our hypervisor tools are just caked into the operating system, so our normal tools will work. Excellent, excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time here. Uh, so uh, now this is uh, um, uh, the slide that you had here. I'll click through as you as you instruct me to do so, okay? Sure. So we have a lot of different components to our data center. We have the virtualization layer, whether it's going to be Hyper-V, VMware, Zen, KVM, whoever else it's going to be, and you need a tool to manage that. And vCenter Server does a spectacular job of managing that for VMware, and System Center Virtual Machine Manager does a spectacular job of managing it for Hyper-V. But let's look at what else we have in our data center. Click through. We have our servers. And the servers may be, well, hold on, hold on. Servers may be Windows or Linux, and they may be Dell or HP or whoever else. But we have to, A, manage the operating systems. B, we have to manage and monitor the hardware. Now, VMware certainly does a good job of managing the hardware. I think Microsoft does a better job of monitoring and managing the operating system itself, whether that's Windows or Linux, because we have management packs for both. <laughs> then we have our networking, if you want to click, and that again can be Cisco, HP, Juniper, and this is again something that VMware does really well. vCenter will help to monitor your virtual, well, I don't know if it will monitor it, but it will help integrate your virtual environment into your physical networking. Microsoft, on the other hand, we have to be able to monitor everything, so System Center Operations Manager is going to monitor your networking, and we have management packs available, available for that. 
If we want to click again, we have applications on our service, mail servers and databases and web servers. That's where VMware doesn't really have a competitive platform and they rely on other tools. Well, most of the tools that they rely on are going to be System Center Operations Manager, whether it's Exchange or Apache, whether it's Tomcat, whether it's SQL or Oracle or whoever else. We have management packs for that. And click again. We have desktops, laptops. Uh, some of them are going to be running modern Windows. Some of them will be running legacy or Linux or whoever else. And again, System Center manages and monitors all of that. And our storage, there we go. EMC left hand, whoever it is, 3PAR, NetApp, again, System Center manages that. And that's something that VMware also does a really good job of managing. As far as backing up, I always say pick your tool. Whatever tool you do, as long as it does what you want to do, it'll do it. So VMware has some great backup tools. Microsoft has some great backup tools. But System Center Data Protection Manager is included in the System Center suite. So when we quick click one last time, unlike VMware, we're going to see that System Center 2012 manages and monitors the entire data center, the entire infrastructure a lot better and a lot more completely than VMware. Even if VMware were the same money, it's not. But if it were, we are delivering so much more for so much less. Well, thank you uh, for your uh, for your time. Uh, we did have one question one question on this, but I think I'm going to save it here for uh, for after Sean's uh, uh, rebuttal. So, Sean, you gave yourself a little bit of extra time there, so uh, feel free to to uh, provide a rebuttal here. Okay, can you back up? Just one slide. Yeah, so just the overview here. Um, I, I agree a lot with what Mitch is saying, but I would say even from a VMware side, I don't think you can use just Virtual Center to manage, for example, your storage. When you look at storage performance, System Center is going to give you an overview of performance from a storage perspective, but there's so much intricate details that you have to get into. And, and same thing from a vSphere perspective. When you're dealing with storage, you have to deal with reads and writes and IOPS and, and virtual channels and how they're being multipathed. And you really have to get into the storage and the software replication to remote sites, replication to different uh, different nodes on your storage depending on how you're set up it could be storage tiering depending on you know if you're running ssds and a mix of different storage so a lot of that you'll see some basic things through both system center and vcenter uh, which might help you troubleshoot a little bit but when you really want to get down and dirty to what your storage is doing you're going to have to go to the storage you're, you're going to have to manage that through both vmware and uh hyper-v but you'll get some basic statistics from both um, and that's really uh, most of the things I, I would agree with Mitch on. I, I don't know, um, you know, Mitch was talking about having System Center in place. I don't, I, I've got about 120 customers that I work with, and I don't have a single one running System Center. So to say that you need to have it or you already have it in place, um, that may be true, but none of my current customers have it. So, uh, yeah. Sean, this question is more along the lines for you. There, there's been a question about uh, about VCOPS. How, how does that compare to SCCM? And and Mitch, you you feel free to weigh in on this as well. Well, it doesn't. SCCM is Configuration Manager. So sorry, uh, System System Center. Well, yeah, and System Center has an Operations Manager. So Operations Manager compared to uh, vCenter Operations Manager, they're obviously two different products. Um, Operations Manager from Microsoft, and again, Mitch could speak to this better than I could, but it manages not only your virtual environment, but your physical environment as well, which provides a great tool to, if you have an integrated both mixed physical and virtual, uh, their product does both. The, the product with VMware only does VMware. Now, they're talking about expanding beyond that at some point in time, but as of right now, it only does your VMware environment. Um, VMware's got a pretty heavy push on from a licensing perspective where it doesn't cost you a whole heck of a lot more to add operations managers. Uh, and, and they won't tell you this from a client perspective, but there's a lot of spiffs going on on the back end to sell it to you. So um, that's probably why all of you have been approached by your VMware consulting companies to run operations manager. It is a decent product. Um, 
they have a free version out there if you want to just check it out i'll tell you it's called foundation it's kind of a it gives you some statistics but you can't drill down very far once you go up to the advanced version you can really get a lot more information all right thank you mitch mitch do you have anything to add there no i think he covered it very well all right excellent excellent okay we're on to topic number three uh, which, uh, and, uh, Mitch, this is uh, this is uh, for you. Um, the uh, getting into the networking here. So, so feel free to get started here. So, I'm going to be the first person to concede that VMware networking is a lot more robust than Microsoft ever has been. Uh, it is certainly allows you to do anything that you would want, but I would think that most of that has already been done in the physical. Now, in Hyper-V 2012, we've introduced a lot of improvements in the entire... There used to be a press-your-dummy networking approach for Microsoft. It's gotten a lot better, so you can work as simply or as robustly as you want. So we've introduced extensible versible switches, uh, extendable virtual switches, where you can... You, uh, there are a couple that come out of the box, and they do monitoring and port monitoring and things like that. But you can extend it with the Cisco 1000V. You can extend it with the 5.9s or the F5. There's all sorts of different ones for security and for extendability. We've added uh, all sorts of protections like the ARP and ND poisoning protection and the DHCP guard. Um, all sorts of things that have made it a lot better than it was. I will say up and down that VMware is a lot more robust, but it's also a lot more complicated. And the vast majority of companies don't need that level of complication. Thank you, Mitch. I, I, I have a question from the field before we have uh, Sean's rebuttal here, and it has to do with the ART poisoning protection. They mentioned that, you know, that was also built into Windows 7, but most enterprises disable it due to, uh, due to false, pos or false negatives. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, uh, do you know if, if that is actually being used, if it's, if it's as good as or better than what was available with Windows 7? It, uh, I can't speak to that because I'll be honest, I never used it in Windows 7. I do know that it is uh, a solid product now that works really well, and I do know several companies who are using it. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. Good, good, good answer. Uh, Sean, uh, your turn for a, a rebuttal here. Well, I think a lot of what Mitch said was, uh, was good. VMware does have a lot of options for networking. They have their basic standard virtual switches, which... To be honest with you, I think most companies, that's all they need. Um, if you purchase the Enterprise Plus version of uh, vSphere, you then have the option to use what's called the distributed switch. And that's the neat thing about VMware products is you have the ability to keep your environment pretty simple or get as advanced as you want. I will say with the distributed switch, you can... Uh, you can have a lot of options, which can be a little bit confusing. But all of the all of the functionality, like for example, Mitch mentioned the Cisco uh, add-on switch, which they have for VMware, and now they ported it over to Microsoft. Um, I don't know a lot of people that are using it, even though it's available. I know a lot of people who've tried it, haven't had a lot of success with it, and they've gone back to basic distributed switch. Um, I know we converted our environment to a distributed distributed switch around Christmas time um, nine months ago. And the main reason we did it was because we switched to a, a full 10 giggy network. So instead of having 10 NICs per server, we had, I believe, two 10 giggy and two or four uh, one giggy NICs. And we implemented the distributed switch and went through there and implemented a lot of the QoS and a lot of these things that are available here through the networking that you get through third party products with uh, Hyper-V, you get built right into VMware right out of the box. Uh, Sean, why don't you go ahead and just continue on with your uh, overview of uh, the VDS that, that you brought in, brought up. Sure, and, and I just included a bunch of slides. I'm not going to go through every single bullet point because i got two, three slides on this. So I, I just thought I'd been here. Uh, VMware, the way they work is you build a distributed switch. You connect it to a specific NIC and then you define what's called a port group. Now, whenever you're dealing with distributed switches, they just add a DV in front of everything, a DV port group, a DV uplink, you know, whatever. Um, but we have a lot of options where we can control things like inbound and outbound traffic shaping, just 
controlling bandwidth control with that quality of service. Um, we have what's called a NIC teaming policy for security that we can do at a port group level. Um, network V motion. This one's pretty cool. I can run a VM that's running, let's say, a VoIP application. I can V motion or move from one host to the other while 20 people are connected to phone calls to this VoIP application. And not only will it move the CPU and the memory from one host to the other, but it will move the networking from one host to the other. So you won't even drop calls while you're while you're doing a vMotion from one host to the other, which is pretty cool. You gotta have the distributed switch to do that, but uh, it's not that hard to implement. Uh, um, yeah, and here's just some more stuff that it, that is supported in the distributed switch. I'm not gonna go through much of this here. One thing that was um, uh, that was mentioned here uh, by one of our students uh, is that uh, um, to his understanding, uh, VMware uh, supports uh, network address translation NAT and, and Hyper-V does not handle NAT. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, Mitch in your in your rebuttal maybe you can talk a little bit about that as well. Well I'm not sure why Hyper-V doesn't uh, cover NAT because Windows covers NAT and Hyper-V is part of Windows so it absolutely does. It's part of it whether it's through um, RAS or through the Windows firewall or through direct access. We have all of the security that you're going to need uh, built in right there. Now, that's not to say that you don't need virus protection and anti-malware and uh, intrusion protection, but yeah, it's absolutely included. As for a lot of these features, uh, if you want to look at the two or three slides that Sean has, we see things like SRIOV, well, we've got that, and network virtualization, we've got that. Um, uh, QoS, we have that. VLAN tagging, we have that. Um, it's, they're all things that we have built in because our, uh, we've, I mean, we've been running servers for a very long time. Uh, all of these are features that are included in Windows, and anything that's included in Windows is supported by Hyper-V. So we've got all that. We, and now there were some shortcomings. The first time I ever thought Hyper-V, I got nailed with the Nick Teaming thing. Well, we've now got Nick Teaming in there. And we can have it built into the operating system, not relying on third parties. We, we can team uh, two dissimilar Nicks from two different vendors without a problem. And speaking of which, that's somewhere you're going to see great improvements in VMware, where our... Uh, if the hardware is supported by Windows, it is supported. Whereas with VMware, you have a lot uh, shorter list of, su of supported vendors. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Sean, you also had some additional time. Uh, did you want to share anything uh, additional on this particular topic? Well, regarding the NAT, I, I don't know what aspect he was talking about as far as NAT goes. Like if he's a uh, like I know one of the things we do with NAT is we'll sometimes set up a, an internal only virtual switch, we'll build a VM, and then we'll use the VM to NAT to other VMs. Or is he talking about running NAT from the host to the VMs and letting the host handle the NAT? Um, there's several different ways that I know for a fact that Hyper-V can handle NAT and, and do it well. I've, I've done it. Um, but I'm, I'm just not sure as to the definition of this question. If you'd like to send an email to... Uh, to Dwayne or to post it in chat, uh, Mitch and I would both be more than happy to get into a more advanced discussion or post on the forums and Mitch and I would love to go back and forth and get more detailed into what you're looking at specifically with Nat. I know there was a question as to uh, a particular support option that you had that Microsoft might have a little bit of problems with, but Mitch and I could definitely go back and assist you with that in more detail later. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that that's how I would do Nat as well. I would create a private network. Uh, between all of my virtual machines and have one NAT firewall server that acted as the gateway and the host would be left out of that just because you've got your virtual machines doing all of the work and you can let your resource pool run free. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I appreciate that. Uh, let's move on to that next topic here, and and this is uh, this topic is a little bit around storage here. So, Sean, uh, if you would uh, kick us off here. All right. Uh, obviously, storage is extremely important to any virtual environment. Um, the thing, and Mitch, if you could 
mute your mic. I think we're getting feedback there. Uh, great. Um, when you when you look at, I'm in a customer right now, like I said, in Los Angeles, and uh, we're having a problem with storage. They don't have enough uh, physical disks in here, so we're having a problem with disk latency. And uh, it has nothing to do with multipathing. I could have 50 paths to these disks. They don't have enough spinning disks. Um, so we either need, you know, more disks or faster disks or, or something. So VMware gives you a lot of options, but I don't care if you're running VMware, or Microsoft, whatever. If you're trying to run a thousand VMs across eight spinning disks, it ain't going to work. Um, so VMware does have some pretty cool things built in, uh, like multipathing. And what that does, that just, we got these 10 spinning disks on the back end. We've got two or three NICs on there going to it. We can have some of the traffic going across NIC 1, some going across NIC 2, some going across NIC 3. Um, if we have a failure of those NICs, how are we going to handle that? Are we going to reroute the traffic somewhere else? And that's, you know, part of your all pass down. We can do storage I.O. control, storage DRS. What this is is if we have multiple SANs and we determine that one SAN or one LUN is getting overloaded, it will automatically move the data from one SAN to another SAN on the back end. Um, obviously, that takes time. I moved to VM yesterday. It took almost three hours to move because it was uh, a couple terabytes or something like that. So, you know, but it will do it automatically without even having to think about it. You know, they've had support for, you know, 16 gig fiber channel if you're running that. So all kinds of cool stuff. I think we have another slide on this, don't we, Dwayne? Yeah, well, that's, I think you're right. You know, they, they tell, one of the things that VMware has is they built a lot of APIs so that companies like NetApp and uh, EMC and, and whoever your SAN vendor is, you can offload a lot of stuff to the SAN vendor. So for example, one of the things we mentioned on here is uh, block zeroing. And, and uh, what that is, is when we create a LUN and we want to zero out all the blocks, we just throw that off to the SAN and let the SAN do it. So we basically give an instruction to the SAN and the SAN does it the best way it can versus vCenter having to zero out all those blocks for us. Same thing with full copy. So instead of taking a file and copying it to Virtual Center and then to the new LUN, it will just tell the uh, SAN, hey dude, copy it from LUN A to LUN B and the SAN does all the work. So it greatly, spe greatly uh, speeds things up. I mean, we're, we're seeing things that used to take two hours to copy are now copying in you know, five, six minutes. Yeah, you so, only got about 10, stuff. 15 seconds left. Yeah, is there anything else on this? Uh, no, I think, uh, I don't know, it's up to you. Is this it? <laughs> no, I, I mean, is there any other slides on storage? No, or is this no, last this one? is your last one. Okay, yeah, and a lot of people are using NAS. Uh, when you look at NAS, you're looking at companies like NetApp, so there are a lot of things that integrate with NetApp. Uh, it's a pretty big vendor out there. I'm in, I'm in I live in Raleigh and NetApp's huge out there in Raleigh, so I, I run into it all the time. Thank you, Sean. Uh, excellent. And and Mitch, uh, time for your rebuttal. I have nothing to rebut. He so he outlined storage on the VMware very well. And again, it's they've been doing it a very long time. They've got some great solutions. And Microsoft within the virtualization world has had to catch up, but we've done it. So you see that we've now got our virtual fiber channel and that was new. And if you want to click, um, we have things like the native 4K disk support, which makes it uh, our storage in the virtual hard disks a lot more efficient. And speaking of more efficient, do you want to click one more time? Um, did I mention 64 terabyte <coughs> virtual hard disks? And this is uh, one place where we blow all of the competition out of the water. Now, a lot of you may say, why would you need a 64 terabyte virtual hard disk? And you're right, most people don't. But if you can think of a reason to need 2.1 terabytes, that's reason enough to go to VHDs or VHDX files. Because everyone else, even Microsoft previously, was supporting up to two terabytes. Now, VMware has said you can use extents to go bigger, but they've also said, I don't know, they've backed away from this over the last year or two, but they used to say that extents were not supposed to be a permanent solution. So this is a place where Microsoft has really uh, gone ahead and said, okay, we can go up to 64 terabytes, and they're a lot faster, and they've got much better performance. If you want to click again, we have offload data transfer, which is 
going to do a lot of what uh, what Sean said. Uh, offload your storage intrusive tasks right to the SAN so it gets done more efficiently. Now add to that, if you want to click through, we have, we've introduced a new concept in Windows Server 2012 called storage spaces and storage pools. And what this is going to allow you to do is essentially make SANs obsolete. You can, do, you can take JBODs or local direct attached storage and create a storage pool. Now this would essentially be, I used to call this a software RAID 10 generations beyond what software RAID ever was. You can take 10 drives and put them together and you can do it on the fly. So if you've got 8 drives in an array and you need to expand the storage, just plug in a new drive, expand the space and it's done. It takes 5-10 seconds, that's it. It's a, it, support, it is supported with SAS and SCSI and SATA and IDE. Heck, if you want to put an IDE drive in there, I don't recommend that for your servers, but it'll be supported. So we've got the primordial pool that's populated, and you just take those disks and poof, your storage space it literally can be created in three, four minutes, and that's it, and you're ready to go. So SANS, all of a sudden, with the inclusion of this and the software iSCSI targeting into Windows, you can really eliminate the need to purchase new SANS for a lot of your environments. I'm not saying do that, but you have the option for smaller businesses of saving thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Storage in, in, uh, Wind in Hyper-V is storage in Windows, so obviously it's, uh, it's got a lot of features that just, whether you need it for virtualization or need it for your host or you need it for your virtual machine, it's just there. And it's familiar. Excellent, thank you, Mitch. I, I really appreciate that. And and Sean, a, a rebuttal. Sure, you can go back to slide. I sure can. Just pull the whole thing up. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to talk about on this slide here is. Um, the 64 terabyte virtual hard disk. One of the things Mitch mentioned was using extents. Uh, the extents would be good for extend, expanding your uh, data store, which is where you would essentially take two, two terabyte LUNs and patch them together to get a total of a four terabyte LUN or a four terabyte data store. That's great, and you could do that to get 64 terabytes of data store, but that doesn't solve the problem of you're still limited to a two terabyte VMDK within VMware. So with 5.1, you have the ability to create a single data store with a single 64 terabyte LUN, but you're still limited to a two terabyte VMDK within the OS or within VMware. So the, the way around it, there's really a couple ways because I've actually had numerous customers that had to have more than 10 terabytes of space due to databases for Exchange and Oracle and stuff like that. Uh, we try and do database segregation, but sometimes you just can't. Um, and, and what you can do is you have, VMware has the capability to do raw device mappings, which gets you up to 64 terabytes, fairly common. And what I've been doing a lot for Exchange is a lot of in-guest iSCSI, and then we do multi-pathing through the in-guest iSCSI, which is actually using the Microsoft iSCSI initiator. Uh, I do it a lot through NetApp, which uses SnapDrive, but even SnapDrive uses the underlying Microsoft iSCSI initiator to get back to the um, data store, or to, back to the disk, I should say. And could you go forward? You know, onto this slide here, I, I know where Mitch is going with this, and, and I think for small customers, this would definitely be viable. VMware with uh, 5.1, Mute, and Mitch, if you can mute your mic again, please. Oh, my bad. Um, with 5.1, VMware has the ability where you can actually do vMotion from one host to the other while using local storage. You don't have to have a SAN in place. So you could build an ESX host with, let's say, six SATA drives, build another ESX host with, let's say, six SATA drives. You can do a live hot migration from host one to host two, moving from local storage to local storage. And although that's available, I don't know a whole heck of a lot of people that are using that. I, I think getting into a, a cheap NAS, like a, a ready NAS for a thousand bucks or something like that, would be a better solution than using like 
local storage or a JBOT or something like that. Um, even though you might be able to do it with VMware, I would never recommend it. Um, I would go with a cheap NAS or a cheap SAN or, or something like that. Um, but it does give you some options. Excellent, Sean. Thank you. Uh, Mitch, you had some additional time. Do you have anything else you'd like to share? Sure. The uh, functionality that Sean described, we call shared nothing live migration, and we've got that too. Um, aside from that, yeah, I agree. I would love to have as much, I would invest more money in storage than I would in anything else, but we have all of the options. We have the multipathing, we have the ISCAs, we have the storage pools, we have all of that available if we need them. Um, now, uh, uh, Mitch, one one student asked earlier how Hyper V works with the V storage uh, or with the with the array integration on storage. Uh, um, d I, I know that you had had brought up the the offload of the of the uh, the file transfers. What about some of those other components like the zero filling and and things of that nature? Uh, does does Microsoft make use of those as well? I will be honest, I think that's a great question. I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but if you email me, I will find the answer for you. All right, all right, excellent. So for those of you that were wondering about that, we'll make sure that that gets posted in our forum. Uh, we'll, we'll get that question in there and, and, uh, and go from there with that, okay? So, so, so excellent. And uh, just as a comment to, to support uh, uh, Mitch a little bit here, uh, one of the students had made mention that the SQL 2012 clustering is great with geo clustering and, and the share nothing. All right, uh, Mitch, uh, it is your turn to finish off uh, your presentation on the very last subject. So we're talking about an environment where everything's in place together. Now, I would love for every one of our listeners to implement everything Microsoft. Thanks. You're not going to do it. You've got some Citrix. You've got some VMware. You've got some all sorts of other things. So the only platform that really does a good job of managing all of these components together for the heterogeneous virtualization environment, not, not only the hypervisors, but the operating system and the storage, and the applications, and the backup, and the networking. All of that together is going to be System Center. We used to have seven different products in System Center. Now it's seven modules in one product. So if you buy one, you've got access to everything. So if you press your button here, we have all of these uh, environments running together, Windows Server, Citrix, VMware, if you want to click. Yes, I will click for you. Uh, I was answering a student question. You caught me in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got everything running, and we can have multiple data centers or multiple clusters or multiple hosts running all of these environments. Now, if you want to be a decent IT professional, I'm not saying good. The only thing you need to be a decent IT professional is don't be colorblind, because we've made it so easy to the point where green is good and red is bad. So in this environment here, we see we have the screen where we have our uh, host one slammed, 95%, host two not doing very much, and we see a red X on our operations manager uh, screen. And all we have to do is we have press the buttons. It's very intuitive. You press uh, on it. You say, do you want to resolve what are called PRO tips, which is Microsoft's answer to DRS clustering. So we press the uh, click again. And as we press the button, as Dwayne presses the button, we migrate some of our resources intelligently from hosts one to host two, and all of a sudden we've got 50% usage on both, and everything goes green again. It's a lot easier to do when you're managing an entire environment as a integrated infrastructure. Now, the great thing about this is this infrastructure is on your metal, and it's on your virtual machines and it's in your remote machines, and it's in your Azure or uh, your Amazon Web Services or wherever you're hosting your virtual machines, you're going to have the same console managing everything. Your app owners aren't going to need to know where their servers are, just know that they're running and running efficiently. So our SLAs are a lot better to, uh, to deliver. If you want to click through to the next slide. Oh, that was all that we had. It's not mine. Yes. <laughs> so, so we have uh, an environment where 
I, I've been telling people for a while that the hypervisor has become commoditized. Now we're looking at, I mean, I, I could have put in a slide that shows that Microsoft allows double the, uh, the virtual memory and double this and double that, but the reality is nobody's using those numbers. The hypervisor doesn't matter. We're at the point where whether you're using ESXi or Hyper-V, you're going to get the same performance on your virtual machines. Yes, we don't allow certain types of overcommitting. We do allow other types of overcommitting. So it's all going to come out in the wash, and it'll all work perfectly in the end. You're going to see some great advancements with that in 2008, 2012 R2, which we're releasing sometime this fall. But even with 2012, this is we're at that point. So everything that you need is in there. So whether it's uh, memory overcommitment, resource overcommitment, balancing, you've all got it in Hyper-V and System Center. Excellent, Mitch. Thank you very much. Uh, and Sean, do you have a rebuttal, or do you want to move on to your slides? Um, well, the only thing I'd really like to say is I think a lot of vendors downplay the importance of things that they don't have as saying it's not important. And an example of that is with VMware, when they came out with ESXi 3.5, it did not have a firewall. And and VMware said, well, it's, it's really not important to have a firewall because ESXi is so secure. Anyway, when, when ESXi went to version 5, they added a firewall back in. Why, why is that? If they didn't need it before in the past, why didn't they now? It's because they didn't have that feature, so it wasn't important. So some of the things that Mitch is saying that Microsoft is downplaying, I think it's just because they don't have it. Now, of course, I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> one question I did have for Mitch is this. Is it called PRO tips or pro tips? I thought it was just pro tips. <laughs> is that an acronym well, for something? Yeah, it stands for performance and resource optimization. Well, there you go. I didn't know that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you go to my slides, VMware does have the capability to do overcommitment. And what that means is this. In a nutshell, if I have two VMs, each configured to use four gigs of RAM, um, that's a total of 8 gigs of RAM. Now, if that VM is, let's say, running, let's just say DOS, DOS isn't going to need 8 gigs of RAM. So in that particular case, VMware is going to give it just the amount of memory that it needs. Now, when you, when you look at this on a bigger scale, let's go to some normal VMs running Windows 2008 R2. If I have 10 VMs running Windows 2008 R2, and let's say they're all configured for 4 gigs of RAM, that, that's 40 gigs of RAM. However, VMware looks at that and goes, they're both running the same processes, CSRSS, LSASS, and it looks at all the memory spaces in common, and it stores them securely as a read-only component. So you might be running 10, 20, 50 VMs on the same host. You only have to store that one memory page one time. Because of that, you're able to get a lot more virtual machine density on our host. I, I was looking at one of my hosts today, and I believe we had 375 VMs running on a single host, and we were only at 25% CPU capacity and less than 50% memory capacity on that guy. Um, so you can get quite a bit of VM density because of some of the things that VMware has built in, like transparent memory page sharing. And, and I could talk about page sharing for 20 minutes. Um, Enjoy next slide. You know, they, they have memory overcommitment here where you can actually, and this falls into transparent page sharing. You can have multiple VMs sharing it. So if you have, in this case, it, it's really an overblown thing because we had 178 identical VMs, 100% identical. So we were able to run it on 19 gigs of memory. Um, probably not extremely realistic, but 178 VMs on 19 gigs of memory. Let's go to the next one. VMware has a, another thing called the balloon driver. Again, a pretty complex thing, but it's just a tool that VMware has to be able to reduce the amount of memory that VMs are using and be able to run more VMs per host. You can go next. Um, and you can just skip this one here. But they have a swap file per VM. You can skip this one as well. And you can go, go to that one slide that's kind of a unified slide, Dwayne, right here. When, when we look at, and, and this is just memory, we're not talking CPU and storage and networking, we're talking just memory and, and memory overcommitment. 
VMware has a ton of different tools to be able to optimize memory utilization from transparent page sharing to ballooning to compressing your, your memory cache to swapping on the VM. Swapping, and when we look at swapping, there's numerous types of swapping. There's swapping inside the VM using like pagefile.sys. There's swapping on the VM using a swap file. And there's actually two swap files for each VM now and swapping on the system. So there's lots of different ways that you can maximize your memory. And if anybody's ever run a VMware environment, typically the most used resource is memory. And I believe that's all I got, Dwayne. Yeah, I believe that is uh, all that you have as well. Uh, you have time here for a rebut, uh, uh, Mitch. I, I can't hear you, though. See, when I mute my microphone so that it's all quiet for him, it stays quiet until I unmute. <laughs> So I would start by uh, reminding Sean that uh, DOS is no, not only is it no longer supported, it's gotten to the point where we've reallocated the acronym to something else. <laughs> um, VMware also supports NTFS, which I find hilarious because we wrote M NTFS and we don't support it anymore. And I've unfortunately had the opportunity to find out what that support means. It's not really support. Um, transparent memory page sharing is one of those things that's really cool on paper and it scares the bejeebers out of me. I once asked a manager at VMware Learning, um, I said, you know, if, if transparent memory page sharing were sharing the same memory page across 100 virtual machines, doesn't that mean if one of them was to be compromised in that secure space, that all 100 virtual machines would be compromised in a nanosecond and it would by bypass all security. And after, I mean, after being a little, I mean, he turned white for a minute and then said, well, it's never happened. And he walked away into a, a place where I wouldn't follow him. Uh, Microsoft does have dynamic memory. We have memory over commit. And we literally can allocate a virtual machine to use as little memory as it needs and allocate it when it needs more, give it the same contention resources. So we set a minimum and a maximum. But I think we do a better job of that than VMware because, frankly, we don't create a page file when we start up that virtual machine that, or a swap file that swaps it out to RAM so that, or to hard disks so that if you don't have the contention resources available, all of a sudden things slow down. Uh, we do have the balloon driver, and uh, we do it a little differently, but the way we, it's done in VMware worries me. If I say a absolute minimum amount of virtual of physical RAM is going to be allocated to a virtual machine, I don't want ESX deciding, well, you know what, that's the minimum that he says. I'm still going to take away from that by ballooning and putting it to the hard drive. There are all sorts of ways of memory commit. I think VMware does a great job of overcommitting for the most part. I think they are... Uh, memory compression is spectacular. There, the the performance. Now we're not going to have 178 virtual machines running identically, so that particular rate is a little off. But yeah, it's it does a good job uh, if you're careful. And just like that, if you're careful with Viet, with Hyper-V, you can overcommit very nicely as well. Thank you, thank you, Mitch. Um, gentlemen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up just a couple of things here. You guys, you guys just kind of gather gather some final thoughts. I'm going to give each of you guys a, a couple of minutes to share some final thoughts um, uh, uh, here here in just a moment. And and uh, um, uh, Mitch, I'll probably start out uh, with you just so that you you know that you're first in line here. Okay. Sure. All right. So, um, so, so give me give me uh, let me go through a couple slides and then you can then you can share your final thoughts. All right. Sure. Okay. So uh, everybody, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us here. Uh, we have uh, recorded the session and we will have that available on the VM training website and on the uh, YouTube VM training channel uh, where you can also see a few demonstrations and both Sean and Mitch's previous demonstrations. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody about uh, our forum. If you guys have any questions or, you know, Tonight, when you're sleeping, you wake up with a question you would have liked to have asked today. Just go to our vmtraining.net forum, ask that question. Uh, both uh, Sean and, and Mitch uh, will be able to, to answer any and all questions that, that are posed, 
posed to them. We also have a number of other experts that, that monitor that forum and, and are more than happy to, to help out as well. And for all I know, most of you guys might be expert enough to help answer a few questions also. Also, just keep in touch with our blog. Uh, we're posting regular blog articles. Uh, some of them are around storage. Some of them are around memory. Some of them are around security. Uh, some of them might be on exchange. You, you never know what we're going to end up. Whatever's going on in the technical realm uh, uh, that, our, that our authors choose to write on, that's what's going to end up there. But I will tell you that all of them are very relevant to an administrator's needs in the industry. Uh, so so uh, uh, feel free to monitor that, sign up to receive any new updates as we do, we do post that information uh, uh, as we go forward. Now, we, I wanted to just quickly remind everybody that these two guys are gurus in the field and they've both been involved in development of, of uh, separate classes, the, the vSphere Ultimate Boot Camp and the Microsoft Virtualization Ultimate Boot Camp. Uh, and if you want to get some really good solid training, just check out our VM training website, give us a call, send us an email, whatever it might be. These two guys uh, uh, get the opportunity to teach as well and, and you can have some very solid training on, on both of these components. And, and, and if nothing else, we know uh, that uh, as, a, as a moderator, I take a look at this and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, they're both really good products. And, and uh, as Mitch pointed out earlier on, it's really going to boil down to cost. And what is the cost associated with you? What features do you need? What is the cost that is going to be to you in your environment without having to change everything to fit one or the other? We haven't announced our next webinar yet because we're going to be waiting for VMworld 2013, which is at the end of this month. And after that, after that uh, VMworld, we will announce a, a late September uh, webinar. Uh, we don't know the topic yet. It's going to depend upon what's announced at, at VMworld. So all of that plays a role here. Uh, gentlemen, why don't we finish up with uh, some of your final topics? And 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 Mitch, uh, I'd like you to go ahead and 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 kick us started here with your w w with uh, just some final thoughts. So over the years, I've uh, I've been teaching both VMware and Hyper-V. As a Hyper-V evangelist, I've heard from the VMware crowd that well, Microsoft's virtualization isn't ready because, and they would list 10, 15 different things. And then we released 2008 R2, and that list got smaller. And R2, uh, two, uh, SPAC, SP1, and it got smaller. In 2012, we're at the point where we've really reached almost feature parity on the two. And now the VMware argument seems to be, well, we've been around longer. Uh, we invented x86 virtualization. And I ask you, in response to that, how many of you have a Marconi radio or a Daimler uh, car? or have flown in a Wright Brothers airplane. It's not a question of who's first, it's a question of who's best. Now, I think I don't think Microsoft is better than VMware. I think, however, we are certainly on a par, and we do some things a little better, and they do some things a little better. But overall, um, it's, it's gotten to the point where you should look at what it's gonna cost you, and how much money you can save in, in the end, and Microsoft is definitely the way to go. Thank you, Mitch. I, I very much appreciate your time today and your expertise. Uh, Sean, uh, your final thoughts. Um, well, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and I, I think Microsoft is definitely getting a lot better. Um, when, I, when I teach my VMware classes, one of the first thing I do is I start off and I say, I want you guys to realize that I'm not just a VMware nut. I started off as a Microsoft certified trainer. I've got my MCSE. I built and developed over 25 classes for Microsoft, and I've taken over 93 Microsoft exams. I've been to Redmond over 20 times. I actually kind of like Microsoft. I think VMware has a better product. I think Microsoft, though, is catching up. I think their product is getting a lot better. I'm, I'm still a Microsoft guy. I just finished up an exchange migration last night at 3 a.m. Um, you know, I, I, I still do lots of Microsoft stuff. And it's, uh, it's exciting to see some of their new products that are coming out, which are very exciting. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited to see where they're going with Hyper-V. I, I think it benefits 
the most the customers because it gives you guys true options to say what here's what we got here's where we want to end up which product is right for us and i really don't care if i implement hyper v or vmware i want to implement the right product for my particular customers needs whatever that product might be so thank you all for coming Thank you, Sean. I, I appreciate that. Now, Sean made mention of a lot of new products that, that have been released and are continuing to be released. And and uh, keep track of VM training as well, whether you're an exchange uh, company, SQL, Oracle, SharePoint. Uh, there's going to be a lot of new Ultimate Boot Camps released. Not only, not only Mitch's uh, Microsoft Virtualization Ultimate Boot Camp, but we're, we're going to be releasing a lot of additional Microsoft Ultimate Boot Camps as well. And, and the reason we're doing that has a whole lot to do with the fact that we know your job roles because we have consultants in the field, individuals performing the job, and we're creating courses that, that apply to your specific role, not just a portion of it, the whole thing. And, and we're here to try to serve you guys and, and help you guys get the best out there so that you can perform your job better, easier, faster, so you can go golfing go fishing, go spend time with your family, uh, whatever it is that you enjoy doing after work hours. We don't want you guys to be spending 3 o'clock in the morning like Sean is uh, doing an exchange migration. Hire him to do that stuff so that you can spend more time elsewhere. Anyways, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, be watching for this uh, video. This uh, video will be posted in short order, uh, and we will send all of you guys uh, a copy to that link when it is ready to go. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.